Praise God. Now, we are continuing our growth track takeover here in the tabernacle. And this is the third session of three that we have on our subject that we've been dealing with the past two Wednesday nights called Spiritual Authority. And uh, we have a little handout for those of you that are here in the congregation. We want everybody to have one so that you have an opportunity to follow along just kind of in outline form the information that I'm going to be sharing tonight. So if you haven't received one of these, didn't get one when you came in, just raise your hand, wave it around. The ushers will serve you with one so that everyone has an opportunity to follow along. Now, yours has blanks. I've got all the answers. So uh, I've got all the answers for this. I don't have all the answers for everything. So don't, don't, let, me, don't let me get away with that. Amen. Praise God. But we're going to be dealing with chapters 9 and 10 in our book that we've been using the past few weeks called Spiritual Authority by Watchman Nee. Somebody said, well, I don't have a copy of the book. Well, unfortunately, we don't have any more remaining here at the Columbus campus. So I'm sorry that we cannot serve you with one. But uh, <clears throat> it is a, a, a very helpful book. It has a lot of concepts in it that have been very helpful to lots of people, both here at World Harvest Church and also in Valor Christian College. So I uh, want to share with you, if you have your book with you tonight, we're going to be dealing with chapters 9 and 10. Chapters 9 and 10. Somebody said, well, what about chapters 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8? Well, that's all good stuff, but uh, since I only had three chances, I just wanted to deal with chapters 1, chapters 2 and 3, and chapters 9 and 10. So we're going to get right into it. And once again, our text for the overall study that we've been doing is Romans chapter 13, the first several verses where it talks about uh, God being the source of all authority and all authority in our lives eventually harkens back to God. The concept of authority came from him and um, the powers or authorities that exist have been set in place by God. Somebody said, well, my, my boss wasn't set in place by God. He just got hired by the company. Well, the fact that he's in a position of authority means that that authority, regardless of what kind of position he's in or what kind of character he has, the fact that he's in authority means he is under God's authority, whether he acknowledges God or not. So uh, we can't pick and choose which authorities we're going to obey. God has ordained them all, and we, have, uh, we are required to submit to them all. Amen. So... Uh, I'm going to read tonight's scripture, and then I'm going to pray, and then we're going to get right into the Word. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 through 12 is our text for this evening. And uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 through 12, I'm going to read from the modern English version. So if you have a different version, yours will read a little bit differently. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trial and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment, especially those who walk after the flesh in pursuit of unclean desires and despise authority. They are presumptuous and arrogant and are not afraid to slander the angelic beings, whereas angels who are greater in power and might do not bring slanderous accusations against them before the Lord. But these people are like irrational animals born to be captured and destroyed. They speak evil of the things that they do not understand, and in their corruption, they will be destroyed. And a companion text is from Matthew chapter 12, verse 34. This is Jesus speaking here to the Pharisees and his enemies. And he says, O generation of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. It's a lamp unto our feet. It is a light unto our path. And we thank you for giving us illumination in the way that we should walk. And Father, when you reveal it, when the light of revelation truth shines upon our path, we will walk in it in a manner pleasing to you. And we thank you for the opportunity in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. For those of you that are visiting, my name is Bill Canfield. I am the senior elder here at World Harvest Church. It's been my privilege to have served here for over 34 years now. I'm very thankful. 
for the opportunity that Pastor Parsley has given me to stand here in this place where so many great men and women of God have stood, including our pastor, Dr. Rod Parsley, an apostle to the body of Christ and to the nations of the world, and where so many wonderful guests are going to be standing just a few days from now at Dominion Camp Meeting. Uh, don't miss Dominion Camp Meeting. We call it legacy. There's a re very good reason for that. And I believe that Pastor Rod Parsley is going to be releasing something at this camp meeting that he's never had the opportunity to release uh, before. And I've been to, I guess, every camp meeting service we've had. And uh, it's going to be remarkable. I'm not going to miss it, and I don't want you to miss it either. Amen. All right, let's move forward here with our study. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 15, verses 10 and 11, Hear and understand. That which goes into the mouth does not defile a man, but that which comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. What is in a person's heart in abundance will come out of his mouth. You don't have to listen to people talk very long before you can easily determine what it is that they have placed on the inside of them. If the only thing that they can talk about is Wheel of Fortune, then chances are that's what they've been watching every single day. If the only thing that they can talk about is what they've seen and heard on the news, whether it's fake news or real news, chances are that's the only thing that they'll talk about. On the other hand, if they've been putting the Word of God inside them, chances are that's what it is that they'll talk about. If they're full of doubt and unbelief, it won't take them very long before they will express that doubt and unbelief. On the other hand, if they're full of faith, it won't take them long before they speak words of faith as well. So out of the abundance or overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. That's what Jesus said. And what it is that comes out of a person is what causes them to be defiled, not what it is that goes in them. It may not come out, what it is, is, is in someone in abundance may not come out in times of comfort and convenience, but allow a little pressure to be applied and see what comes out then. <laughs> someone once said, character is like toothpaste. You don't find out what's inside until some pressure is applied, and it's true. Just allow a little pressure to be applied and see what comes out then during times of discouragement or disappointment or distress or disease. That's when you can tell what's really on the inside of a person. And slanderous and reviling words are one of the first indications of a heart that is full of slander and defilement. Rebellious words come from a rebellious heart. And when people say things like, and, and you'll hear people say this all the time, they'll say something that is completely out of whack and off base and unscriptural, and then they'll say, oh, <laughs> I was just kidding. I didn't really mean that. Let me tell you something, my brother and sister. No amount of apology can make up for criticism and uh, complaint. You need to recognize that whatever it is that's coming out is what is on the inside. The Apostle James had quite a lot to say about the power of words in James chapter 3, verses 6 through 12. Here's what he said. The tongue is a fire, a world of evil. The tongue is among the parts of the body, defiling the whole body and setting the course of nature on fire, and it is set on fire by hell. All kinds of beasts and birds and serpents and things in the sea are tamed or have been tamed by mankind. But, the uh, but no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who are made in the image of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring yield at the same opening sweet and bitter water? Can the fig tree, my brothers, bear olives or a vine figs? So no spring can yield both salt water and fresh water. You know, the Bible is just an amazing book in so many ways because it says what it means, and it means what it says. I mean, you know, I, 
I may have been accused of calling people some stuff in the past, but I never called them vipers. I mean, I never stood up in church and said, you generation of vipers. Of course, I don't guess that'd do much for attendance if you called people that. But here's the thing. Jesus said things and made judgments, not according to the appearance, but according to truth, and he called things just exactly the way they were. The apostle, uh, or, I'm sorry, uh, John the Baptist did the same thing. He said, you generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? Because he recognized that they were coming to him for all the wrong reasons. And so, so uh, here in James chapter 3, he says, the tongue is full of poison. It's on fire. And it got set on fire by hell. And anyone that's ever been accused wrongly, everyone that's ever been slandered, everyone that's ever been misunderstood and your words have been taken and twisted and, and made to mean something that they never were intended to mean, knows exactly what it is that James is talking about here. Everybody that's been, ever been lied on, you know exactly what James is talking about. Now, God forbid that we should engage in that same kind of behavior as believers because as I mentioned last week, God expects us to live differently after we get saved than we did before we got saved. Oh, you missed a good place to say amen right there. God expects our behavior to change when our nature changes. Somebody said, well, I know somebody that goes to church and they've gone to church for a long time and they still act the same way. They just as hateful and spiteful and mean and nasty as they used to live. Well, maybe that's because maybe their behavior hasn't changed because their nature hasn't changed. It always gets quiet when you talk like this, but it's okay. It's all right. It'll help you. Amen. Somebody said, it doesn't feel like it's helping me now. Uh, wait till Tuesday afternoon at 4 o'clock. I bet you it'll help you then. Amen. Or tomorrow night at midnight, it'll help you then as well. In the world, people may seem to be compliant on the outside, but inside they're full of rebellion and strife. God expects his people to be different than the world. They should not only be compliant to his will in their actions, but also in their words. Obedience begins with a heart that is submitted to God's will. I'll say that again. Obedience begins with a heart that is submitted to God's will. Now, we've got lots of examples in the Word of God of people that spoke rebellious words because they had a rebellious heart. And some of them, actually all of them, are examples that we've looked at before, but I'm just going to go through and mention a few of them. They're in chapter 9 in your book, Spiritual Authority. Eve carelessly added to God's Word. God said, don't eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Eve came along and said, well, God said we can't eat of it, but he also said don't touch it. Well, we don't have any record that God ever said that, but she went ahead and added that to God's word. Now, isn't it interesting that she not only ate of the fruit, but she touched it as well. Of course, you can't eat it without touching it. That's the way that kind of works. But uh, she added to the word of God. We must not add to or leave out any of God's Word. It's God's Word, not our Word. We do not have the authority to change it based on our preferences. If you are sent to pick up a lunch order, don't change the order that's already been made based on your preferences because it's not your lunch. Yebit. God doesn't care about the yebits, and neither does anybody that asked you to pick up what they already ordered. You say, yeah, but I like lots of mayonnaise. Well, maybe the person that's ordered the lunch doesn't like mayonnaise. It's their order. It's not your order. I mean, we have that much sense in natural things. We ought to have that much sense in spiritual things. Somebody say amen. Amen. So Eve added to the Word of God, which we must never do. Ham, as we saw in Genesis chapter 9, broadcast his father Noah's failure. 
And the first thing he did when he was aware of his father's difficulty was to go out and tell his brothers who had no knowledge of it. Isn't it amazing? You have a controversy with somebody and they're getting along just fine with other people until you go and tell the other people about the problem you're having with the person you're having the problem with and all of a sudden now everybody's at odds with each other. It's the most amazing thing. And it's all as a result we're talking tonight about the manifestation of man's rebellion and number one is in the words they speak. He broadcast, Ham broadcast his father's failure and he was neither submitted nor loving. And anyone that goes around criticizing and complaining about somebody else's perceived or real faults or failings is neither submitted nor loving either. Because as I mentioned to you last week, love covers, it does not expose. There are certain things about your life that you want to remain covered as well. Uh-huh. Yeah. I know some stuff about you. Somebody said, how does he know? Well, don't worry about that. It, I'm not going through files, all right? That's, that's not what happens. All right. Miriam spake against Moses. Spake. Spoke against Moses. She didn't say much, but it represented resentment that she no doubt felt in her heart toward her little brother. She let family relationships affect God's work instead of accepting the authority and leadership position her younger brother had over her and over all the rest of Israel. Judgment upon her rebellious words was immediate and severe. She got leprosy by the judgment of God. Now she was eventually restored, but many people never receive restoration because words are like bullets. Once they are sent, they can't be recovered, and sometimes the damage they cause is permanent. The little kids on the, on the playground used to say, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never harm me. That's not true. Here's a more accurate way to say that. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will break my heart. And if your bones are broken, we can tell on the outside, because you're going to go get patched up and have a big cast that you'll be wearing for six or eight weeks. But if your heart is broken, we may never know about that because those wounds are carried around on the inside. And sometimes they don't ever get healed until someone has the courage to bring them to the healer who is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Korah and his associates reviled Moses openly and repeatedly, indicating that they had no restraint whatsoever. In essence, here's what Korah said. You remember Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, the ones that got swallowed up by the earth, Numbers chapter 16. In essence, here's what they said. They said, okay, we want to be submitted to God's authority. We just don't want to be submitted to Moses' authority. And they tried to make excuses for their rebellion by saying they still wanted to be submitted to God. Here's the thing. Here's the thing they overlooked. Here's the thing they left out. Here's the thing they forgot about. They said they wanted to be submitted to, Mo to God's authority, but not to Moses' authority. They forgot that it was God himself that put Moses in that position of authority. And so, for them to be submitted to God's authority, they had to be submitted to Moses' authority. People always say, well, how come Moses was the one leading them to the promised land? Because uh, he's the one that knew where, where to go. <laughs> it's always a real good idea when you're following somebody to make sure they know where they're going. Amen. Not Google Maps or MapQuest. How many times have you been deceived by the GPS? <laughs> we'll be going down the road and the GPS will say, turn left in one quarter mile. I said our destination is to the right. <laughs> Beware. 
Before that machine will beat me, I feel like John Henry. Before that machine will beat me, I'll die with a hammer in my hand. <laughs> Pounding it to pieces is what I'll do, yeah. All right. I got to get off that. Rebellious words indicate fleshly indulgence as well as a rebellious spirit, which indicates a life of no restraint, lawless and out of control. When the flesh is in control, all kinds of evil will predominate. God strongly rebukes the rebellious, comparing them to irrational animals, as we read in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 12, that are useless for anything, according to the Bible, other than capture and destruction. Ungodly and rebellious words magnify any problem. Any problem in the workplace, in the family, or in the church. The sin of reviling words will cause the loss of power in any interaction. A church that is filled with reviling and with gossip and with slander will be powerless to accomplish much of anything for the kingdom of God. That's the reason that so many churches do so little in the kingdom of God, because they're filled with ungodly words. Ungodly words against God, ungodly words against the leadership that God has set in place, ungodly words against each other. All kinds of problems result from rebellious words. Too many people are in love with the sound of their own voice. Here's a good suggestion for you. Here's one of those life hacks that people are always talking about on YouTube. Do more listening and less talking. George Marshall, Chief of Staff of the United States Armed Forces during World War II, later Secretary of State under the Truman Administration, said this, Seek first to understand, then be understood. Or, as someone else said, get your tongue on the altar. If you can find an altar long enough to get your tongue on. Amen. So rebellious words are the first of three manifestations of man's rebellion. The second one is also in chapter 9. Reasons. Reasons. Boy, we've got lots of reasons why we do the things we do. Romans chapter 9, verses 14 through 21. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it is not of him who wills, but of him who run, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. Therefore he, God, has mercy on whom he will, and he hardens whom he wills. You will then say to me, why does he yet find fault? For who can resist his will? Rather, O oh man... Here's the argument Paul is making. Who are you to answer back to God? Sounds like what God asked Job when Job started asking God a bunch of stupid questions. Who are you to answer back to God? Shall the thing formed say to who, him who formed it, why have you made me like this? Does the potter not have power over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honor and another for dishonor? Well, those are all rhetorical questions. Of course, the answer, answers to all those things are yes. But words, the point your author is making here, in spiritual authority is that words usually issue out of reasonings. Now, you've heard people say before, well, I just said that before I thought of it. Well, they didn't really. The fact is the process just happened so quickly that they weren't aware of formulating the thought before they got out their mouth. Carpenters have a saying, measure twice, cut once. Christians ought to have a saying, think twice, speak once. And as someone said one time, if you think twice, you'll be ahead of most people. Amen. Reason is not wrong in itself. We're created with minds to think, to reason, to make choices and decisions. But if we allow reason to dictate our spiritual lives, we will fail to obey most of the time because we'll only comply when God's commands make sense to our rational minds. And there are some times, there are a few times, there are a lot of times that God's commandments 
that God's requirements, that God's instructions don't make sense to our natural minds. Somebody say amen. The children of Israel rebelled against Moses in Numbers chapter 16 because of reason. They claimed that they were justified in their rebellion because Moses had not yet brought them into a land of milk and honey since they were still in the wilderness. But their rebellion was not justified. We must determine whether we're going to live according to God's authority or our own reason. It is absolutely impossible to live according to both of those principles at the same time. We've got to choose. We've got to determine whether we're going to live according to God's authority or our own reason. But it will cost us our flesh to live a life of obedience to God. Because we have a bad case of the I want. But what you want is not nearly as important for your well-being as what God wants for you. We just got done singing. He's been better to me than I've been to myself. He knows what conflict you are about to enter into if you continue on the same path you're on. And that's the reason he says you need to get off that path and on this path. It may not make any sense to our natural mind because the path that we're on may seem wide and pleasant. But the Bible said there is a way that seems right to a man, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. It says broad is the way that leads to destruction, but narrow is the way that leads to eternal life. I'd rather find the narrow way, even if there were a few rocks and roots that I had to step over, than the broad way that was paved with cobblestones that were smooth all the way to destruction. We cannot depend on our reasoning. Jesus neither argued with God nor reasoned with him during his earthly ministry. You ever wonder about that? Every time God said to, for Jesus to do something, that's what he did. He didn't say, I don't think that's a good idea. He, doesn't, he didn't say, you know, no, I'm not going to do that. No, you catch me later. He just did what God told him to do. And if we want to be like Jesus... We're going to have to learn to do the same thing. Mm. Here's the truth I want you to remember. God is never without reason. But as far as we're concerned, he is beyond reason. His ways are not our ways. We're not called to understand God. We're called to obey or live a life of obedience to God. A recruit in boot camp doesn't understand why he has to accomplish a task over and over again. It may make no sense to him. But his drill instructor does not give <laughs> explanations. He only gives orders. We have a will. There's no question about that. But God has a will too. And he will not waste his time arguing with you about why he wants a certain thing done. He just won't. He will not contend with you. He won't argue with you. He won't fuss with you. If you insist that you have to understand, God will move on to find someone else who will obey instead of arguing with him, and you will find yourself sidelined and ineffective in your service in the kingdom of God. Maybe that's the reason that some people that you know have never found a place of service in the kingdom of God because they're always busy arguing with God about what it is that he told them to do. And God just won't argue with them. He'll just say, y'all sit over there, time out, and I'll go find somebody who will do what I tell them to do. Instead of asking, why are you doing this, God? We should be asking, who am I to argue with God? We benefit from God's will, not from our reason. Now, here's a question I want to ask you. What is the reason that God did anything for you? What's the reason? I, I think of anything that God did for you. Salvation, healing, deliverance, blessing, empowering, whatever it is. Well, what reason did you give God 
to bless you? What did you bring to the table and say, God, I'll give you this if you'll give me that? The answer is God had no reason to bless you whatsoever. The answer is salvation is not a reasonable proposition. The results are all in God's mercy and not in our merit. We did not give God any reason at all to help us because we were at odds with him and running away from him when he sent Jesus to die for us. It made no natural sense except that God loved us even in our rebellion. You think about it. Why would God send his son? Why would his son volunteer to come? Why would the Holy Spirit make a way for that to happen? According to our reason, it makes no sense. Why do we see a man suffering and bleeding and dying on a cross for sins that he did not commit? Makes no sense to the natural mind. And yet, that's what it is that God did. Your salvation, my brother and sister, the forgiveness of your sins is not at all reasonable. And yet we want to give God all these reasons that we won't do what it is that he tells us to do. We're not God's counselors requiring him to get our approval for everything he does. We cannot tell God what he will and will not do. <laughs> He's God. He's sovereign. All authority is in him. We've lost an important concept in the body of Christ and certainly in the world that used to be called the fear of the Lord, which means a reverential respect for all that God is, including his commands. To reiterate, Romans chapter 9, verse 20 says, Shall the thing formed say to him who formed it, Why have you made me like this? The clay does not rebuke the potter for making the vessel the potter wants to make. It only submits to the will of the potter being formed in the clay. Now here's an interesting point that your author makes. Explanations will do little good when it comes to overcoming our reasonings. They really will. They do very little good. The queen of the south heard of the glory of Solomon's kingdom, but it was only when she visited Jerusalem and saw for herself the glory that Solomon and everyone around him was living in, the Bible said, they didn't even tell me the half of it, and it takes my breath away. I don't need an explanation now. I see it for myself. And of course, the kingdom of Solomon was where they didn't even count silver, they had so much of it, they just piled it up in the streets. Can you imagine something like that? The ancient temple, one of the wonders of the ancient world, worth in today's terms billions and billions and billions of dollars just in the gold that was involved in it. In the same way, it will take a glimpse of the glory of God for us to be delivered of our reasonings. Let me tell you a true story. When my son was seven years old, he was on his way to school, and he was crossing Refugee Road not very far from here. I got a call just after I had come to work that morning here at the church. We weren't here. We were over at the East Annex on Wright Road. And he said, your son's been in, the, the caller said, your son's been involved in an automobile accident, a traffic accident. He's on his way to Mount Carmel East Hospital. You need to go there as quickly as possible. They didn't have any information about his condition. They didn't know what it was that had happened to him, except they did say he's still alive. That's the term they used. They said he's still alive. Well, you can imagine the kinds of thoughts that went through my head. And I got there to Mount Carmel East Hospital, and they let me in the room to see him just briefly. He was covered in dirt and blood. He had a bone sticking out through his trouser leg. His arm was broken, his leg was broken, he was screaming, and he was saying, Daddy, help me. And Daddy couldn't do anything to help him. And they said, Sir, you're going to have to leave the room. We have, to, um, we have to evaluate him and determine what it is that needs to be done for him. They transferred him to Children's Hospital, and I followed the ambulance in our, in our own vehicle. And I can take you to the place on the ramp between 270 South and 70 West as I was on my way to Children's Hospital. And I, the number one question you have at a time like that is, why did this happen? Why, God, why? Is it something I did? 
Is it something somebody else did? Is it a mistake somebody made? Is it, why did this happen? Didn't have any answers to that question. But I'll tell you what I did have. In my little automobile was a 1974 Dodge Dart Brown. In that little automobile, Pastor says, Pastor Parsley says, when God shows up or when God speaks to you, it marks the spot, and it certainly did. God, the presence of God, Almighty God, showed up in my vehicle. He didn't give me an explanation. He didn't give me a lot of reasons. He just gave me his presence. And I knew, I knew, I knew at that moment that everything was going to be all right. Everything was going to be all right. They rushed my son to surgery. He was in the hospital for 10 days. That was uh, 32 years ago. And the only evidence that he had that he ever had that accident was a little scar on his ankle where his skin was broken as the bone came through. God is a faithful God. And his glory will sweep away our reasonings. That's the reason I tell people when we're worshiping, when we have these worship services on Sunday night, people, don't miss that opportunity. Are you kidding me? When we're worshiping in our regular services on Sunday morning and Wednesday night, don't miss that opportunity to get in the presence of God because God wants to do something for you that He can't do by appealing to your reason. He wants to get in your presence. He wants you to get in His presence. And when that happens, you won't need any reasons because you'll have Him. Amen. Yeah, the glory of God will sweep away our reasonings. Reason was the first Adam's principle. Obedience was the second Adam's principle. Who will we follow? Adam in rebellion or Jesus in obedience? You ever tried to reason with a three-year-old? <laughs> Their favorite question is why. And you can't explain yourself to them adequately. Most of the time, you just have to say, I'm the mom. That's why. Why? Because I said so. That's why. It's all the reason you need, kid. In Leviticus 18 through 22, every time God told Israel to do something, he added the phrase, I am the Lord. Why did he say that? He said that because he said, I'm the Lord, and that's the only reason you ever need. I'm God. Just do it. If we bring God down to reasonings, your author says, we will lose him because we make him one of us. In reasonings, we shall not have worship. As soon as obedience is absent, worship is lost. By judging God with our reason, we set ourselves up as gods. That's not a position that I want to be in, and neither do you. So words are the first manifestation of man's rebellion. Reasonings or reasons are the second. The third one is thoughts. This is in chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 through 6 says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is complete. There is progression in rebellion. Now Paul lists them backwards uh, in reverse order in the above passage there. Stronghold, imagination, and thought. But here's how it works. Rebellion begins with a thought. It always begins with a thought. And if that thought is not brought into subjection or obedience to Christ, it will become amplified by the imagination. And if that imagination is not cast down, it will eventually become a stronghold. It will. Let me just show you how it works. Somebody has some disappointment in their life. They have some tragedy that occurs. They're in an accident. Something happens to them, and they're just emotionally devastated, and they begin to feel sorry for themselves. It starts with a thought. Ah, uh, you're just always the victim. You're always the one that's abused. You're always the one that's misunderstood. You're always... A... And then, when they yield to that thought, they may recognize that that thought is not a God thought, that's a thought the adversary put in their mind for them to think about, but then they begin to give their imagination to that. And they say, yeah, bless God. 
I'm the noble victim. I'm the one that's always misunderstood. I'm the one that nobody cares about. I'm the one that's always left out and left back. Even in Little League, I was the last one chosen. Bless God. I'll tell you what will happen. And you see your imagination being given to this thought and it's being amplified. Nobody cares about you. Nobody loves you. Nobody knows anything about you. And it's being amplified. And pretty soon you say, bless God. I'll tell you what. Wait till I'm dead. That'll fix them. They'll all be sorry then. I can just see it now. The mourners are filling the funeral parlor. And they're spilling out into the sidewalk. And they're wrapping all the way around the block. Bless God. They'll feel sorry then. You know what I'm talking about. And then eventually, if you allow that imagination to run rampant with that original thought that you had, before long, you are preoccupied with death. And nobody understands where that stronghold got started. It's very easy to understand where it got started. It got started with a thought. They got placed in your mind like a seed and it grew and the foul fruit of it when it comes to full fruition is a stronghold that you can't get out of by yourself. Now you got to have somebody else's help to get free from that thing. Thought, imagination, stronghold. Somebody said, what do we do about that? Cut it off at the thought stage. The Bible is very clear about what it is that we ought to think about. Philippians chapter 4, think on these things that are pure, just, lovely, virtuous, praiseworthy, if they're of good report. Think on those things. Well, you can't be going around seeing yourself dead when you're thinking about those things. Amen. Thoughts. Rebellion. Our conflict is not outward, but inward. We want to conquer outer space, but we can't seem to conquer our own desires. We want to be masters of our lives, but we can't master our passions. Proverbs 16, 32 says, He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. The battleground is the mind. Our spirits are given life by God. Our flesh is not redeemed yet. The price has been paid for its redemption, but we're not experiencing the redemption of our flesh yet. It's still subject to death. And so it's the soul that becomes the deciding factor of how we will live. The only way to deal decisively with reasonings and thoughts is not by more reasonings and more thoughts, but by the demonstration of the Spirit and the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Both of them are necessary. The Spirit without the Word results in sensationalism, but the Word without the Spirit results in formalism. But it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. Whether or not a person has met authority will be demonstrated by three things. Speaking rebellious words, having many reasons for why they do what they do, and offering many opinions. Have you ever been having a conversation with somebody, and somebody that is completely oblivious to what you're doing comes up and says, well, I'll tell you what I think about that. Wait a minute. Why would you tell us what you think about that? We didn't ask you. Do you ever notice some people know about everything when they really don't know much about anything? Mm. Yeah. Think twice, speak once. Paul on the Damascus Road not only abandoned his task in Damascus, he cast away all his reasons for it and came to the point where he said, what do you want me to do, Lord? King Saul kept the best of the sheep and oxen for a sacrifice when God said, destroy them all. God wanted obedience, not a sacrifice. Nadab and Abihu offered strange fire before the Lord. We saw that in Leviticus chapter 10. According to their own thought, rather than waiting for authorization from Aaron, their father, and the high priest. Rather than offering all our reasons and opinions, our attitude should be as James chapter 4 Verses 13 through 15 says, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go into this city, spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? 
It is just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. Here's what your author says. How can we expect the world to be obedient to the gospel when the church does not obey? A disobedient church cannot expect unbelievers to obey the gospel. God, like any righteous parent, God deals with his own kids first. You don't discipline your neighbor's kids, but you discipline your kids. And the reason that this study on spiritual authority is so valuable is because it helps us develop discipline in our lives, which is necessary for us to be obedient to God to accomplish his will, not just individually, but also corporately. Amen. And I can guarantee you this, as we put these principles into practice in our own lives, we will see the will of God being done in our lives and in the lives of those around us. Don't think, don't think that what, that what you're learning is inconsequential because people will see your behavior and they will be stimulated to change their behavior as a result of what they see you doing. You are a leader in your sphere of influence, whether you think of yourself that way or not. People are watching you, people are paying attention to you, and people are influenced by what it is that you do. And submission to God's authority will yield dividends for you now and not only here, but also hereafter. Somebody say amen. Now, we've come to the end of our time together, but we have not come to the end of our learning. I want to encourage you, those, those of you that have the Spiritual Authority book, to read the entire book. As I said, it's not the Bible, but it is a good and a helpful book. and has principles in it that will help you in your spiritual life. The second half of the book covers being in authority, how to function as those in a position of delegated authority, and that's important information as well. Perhaps we'll have an opportunity to cover some of that at a later time. What we have